to have you. Dr. Shridharani is a renowned Manhattan-based plastic surgeon, board certified by the American Board of Plastic Surgery and founder of Lux Surgery, the confluence of luxury and aesthetic surgery. Dr. Shridharani has co-authored over 100 peer-reviewed articles, textbook chapters, and abstracts of the topics of well-respected medical journal, including the Journal of the American Medical Association and Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. Dr. Sudarani's innovative research has granted him the privilege of presenting his work at esteemed conferences, both nationally and internationally. Welcome, Dr. Sridharani. Thank you so much, April. Pleasure to be here, and thank you for that really kind uh, introduction. Uh, thank you for always being a great partner. It's a pleasure. Both our body and face expert for New York. Thank you. We try to stay busy. <laughs> So let's start out, you know, a lot of people are at home right now, obviously. What can we be doing at home, uh, you know, in terms of if someone's concerned about cellulite, what could someone be doing at home right now? Yeah, so I think, I mean, right now, it's, it's so interesting. There's been so many changes in such a short period of time at the way that we look at aesthetics, the way we look at aesthetic medicine. I think we'd be remiss to talk, to not even mention that for those of us who are at home that have the ability or the luxury of thinking about um, cellulite or aesthetic concerns, that means by default, we've obviously managed to stay safe and healthy during this time, which is just so important because of everything that's happening. With that said, a lot of questions or concerns coming into our practice are, I am at home, I am quarantined, I'm following all the rules. Are there things that I could be doing at home to help maintain all this great work that we've done together over the last few months, over the last few years, aesthetically. Cellulite is a very big hot topic. It always has been. And I think one of the biggest issues as cellulite in particular is such an interesting topic is because historically there really haven't been any great gold standard treatments for it. Cellulite's caused by a lot of different elements. It could be from excess we call sort of lymphedema or swelling uh, in the legs or different elements in the thighs or the buttocks, the skin quality. It can be from um, having extra sort of collagen bundles. Think of like a, uh, a Chanel bag or a tufted pillow, something kind of pulling down that you want to sever those collagen bundles to help things release back up. There can be different elements of fat and fat loculations or different consolidated pieces of fat that hold on to swell. There's a lot of different things that cause cellulite. At-home remedies, for the most part, don't work. We hear about these fascia blasters. We hear about doing all of these different maneuvers at home, which basically is a really nice distraction, uh, but ultimately is not going to make much of a change because it's not getting at the root or the core issue typically caused by cellulite. So patients will say, I did this fascia blaster. I even have a bruise. I did it really, really hard. And what do I do now? Because I think it looks better, but it came back. Well, all you really do is create a lot of swelling. And when that's swole up, it kind of smoothened things out for a little bit. And now we're seeing back to the native anatomy. So when you're saying, what can you do at home? You can get excited about some future treatments on the horizon. That could be really great. I did this fascia blaster. I even have a bruise. I did it really, really hard. And what do I do now? Because I think it looks better, but it came back. Well, all you really do is create a lot of swelling. And when that's swole up, it kind of smoothened things out for a little bit. And now we're seeing back to the native anatomy. So when you're saying, what can you do at home? You can get excited about some future treatments. On a that could be real. Really Thank you, Dr. Shardarani. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Moving on, do you have a specific product line that you prefer? Well, I think there's a few different product lines that are really important. Um, it's not really so much that there's a specific product line per se. As a surgeon, I'm really keen on doing things I think that are going to make sure in general that are going to give a really good outcome or a fantastic outcome. And one of the things that we see are some products, especially from a brand called Environ, which is really great. Um, which allows for a lot of nice changes and improvement to skin texture and quality without it being, um, number one, overly expensive, which I think is important. Number two, you see a great outcome 
and the way that it modulates tissue and creates an ability to improve texture and quality in different areas of the skin. That paired with a brand called Elastin and then even some of Allergan Skin Medica brands all pooled together, I think, when put together curating an entire uh, treatment outcome or treatment algorithm, I guess, by our staff, they can really create some nice changes and improvements. Um, I wanted to actually circle back for a second to the cellulite because one of the things that's really exciting in the world of that is um, even a treatment that we've been playing around with or not really playing, it's been experimenting and using in a very safe way um, that's going to be exciting for the year is that collagenase clostridium histolyticum, CCH, a distant cousin of botulinum toxin or Botox, for example, has a protein or an enzyme that actually destroys those collagen and scar bundles creating cellulite. So what hap this has the potential to be in 2020, the world's first injectable that may be FDA approved to permanently or definitely for long-term impact, get rid of cellulite. So we're moving away from the topicals, moving away from just different treatments and actually getting something that is going to be FDA approved if all goes well. Um, the data is looking very promising and we're presenting on it. I'm an investigator in those studies to help improve cellulite like an injection, uh, which is going to be incredible. Moving along those lines, you do have surgery and a syringe there at the office that someone can come see you for when things are back to normal. Can you tell us more about this? Maybe other options you, you also offer. Yeah. As, as a plastic surgeon, I love to spend my days in the operating room. You wouldn't know it by the way I'm dressed. We get to be a little bit more casual right now, which is nice. Uh, but usually I get to spend my days in scrubs anyway, so I'm always comfortable. Uh, with that said, um, one of the things that we created at Lux Surgery, uh, because we try to be innovative, was a treatment concept called surgery in a syringe. And basically, you started to draw on my surgical principles of understanding anatomy, with an amazing treatment called Kybella, which was the world's first FDA approved fat dissolving injection a few years ago. And Kybella was approved for the neck area to really improve the jawline definition. We took it a step further and applied this concept and principle to different fat pockets on the body, whether it's the jowl or for women who are bothered by that bra fat men who are bothered by a little excess in the abdomen or the side of the chest or different areas like that. And we could basically contour the body, permanently destroy fat, much like liposuction where we suck it out, but instead do it without a single scar. So we created surgery in a syringe. And that's basically using the appropriate products to get a surgical outcome, but not everything always require, requires a scalpel. And I think that's Sort of the concept and that's coming from the surgeon's mouth it pains me to say that we can do amazing work without a knife uh, but we do a lot of injecting and draw on our principles in surgery but non-surgically do those treatments which has been a really great addition to our practice and part of helping thousands of patients from around the globe thank you dr shridharani along those lines who would a good candidate be for a non-surgical body sculpting procedure well, so non-surgical body sculpting is really, the success of that is predicated on a few different elements. Number one, you want to help decrease fat, right? So if we're thinking about body contouring or body sculpting. There's a handful of different elements that go into that. First is going to be, let's get rid of fat. It's kind of like working out. What do we want to do? We want to lean up and build muscle. We want to contour and improve the overall architecture. So there are non-surgical ways to decrease fat. Probably the gold standard are things like surgery in a syringe, like I talked about, and cool sculpting, which is using uh, freezing fat and crystallizing fat. There are limitations and pros and cons to both, which we could get into now or another time, but really ultimately that's gonna help get rid of the fat. Then we can use treatments like cool tone or M-sculpt, which we've heard a lot of buzz about, which use high frequency and high intensity magnetics to stimulate the skeletal muscle. We can cool sculpt the abdomen, get rid of all the fat or a lot of the fat or inject Kybella, then use our cool toner M sculpt to build up muscle so we can see 
a really nice change and get that skull and muscle. To be a good candidate, you need to, in general, be at relatively within about 10 to maybe 20 pounds of your ideal body weight. The less, the better, because you can't rely on something non-surgical to necessarily just clear out all the fat. So that is one really important part. And you want to have good skin quality because you don't want to end up with an empty water balloon if you get rid of all this fat. Now you just have loose skin. So skin quality and a normal body mass index or relatively body, normal body mass index are both really, really key factors in choosing the right candidate. Thank you, Dr. Shudarani. Talking about skin, for someone that has sensitive skin, this is coming in from a viewer, what products would you recommend? So again, I think thinking about sensitive skin, there are so many different skincare products out there. What we try to do is focus on working within sort of a label that we're comfortable with. And I think again, Elastin has been a really great partner for Lux Surgery in terms of the outcomes we're able to get and the science behind those products. Also, um, again, we really like Environ. And there's a whole flurry we could spend an entire hour just talking about the use of like Retin-A, for example, or different things that some of my derm colleagues do or that we of course do as well in good skincare. But I think what you wanna have at its core element are really less inflammatory types of products, things that may not be as high of a concentration of a retinol or a vitamin A or retinoid because that can inflame the skin a little bit. You gotta build up to a higher percentage and that's where working with someone on our team or another, if you're in a different city and you can't get to New York, working with your local skincare specialist can really help. But Skin Medica, Environ, and Elastin have been really great product lines for us, but they have so many different products within those lines that it's a little bit beyond the scope of a quick answer. But those are the three that I really stick with and our patients get great outcomes before and after surgery or just in general. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So this is also from a viewer. They want to know if you can further explain Miradry and how many treatments would one typically need? Sure. Miradry is a really great treatment. Um, it is basically an FDA cleared device to effectively permanently destroy sweat glands, odor producing glands, and the hair follicles in the underarm. So patients often think that it's just gonna get rid of sweat. They don't realize it also is going to de destroy the odor producing glands and those hair follicles. So for men, it typically, so men aren't worried because we have a lot of male patients that get treated with mirror dry, but it's not going to completely eradicate every last hair follicle on a guy. Think of it as just like grooming. For most women, it's like, well, get laser hair removal, so to speak, out of it. This isn't a laser though. It uses microwave or heat technology to basically target and destroy just the glands that do what I mentioned, which is sweat, odor, and the hair follicle. After a single treatment session, most patients will experience anywhere from about 45 slash 50% up to even 90% permanent reduction in their sweat. For someone out there who's listening, um, who may have thought, well, 50% may not sound like a lot. I'll quantify it for you. The standard and typical high dose or intense antiperspirant deodorant gives you four to eight hours of about eight to 10% decrease in sweat. So on the lower limit, you're going to get a four or five fold permanent improvement from a single session. If you're someone who suffers from hyperhidrosis, which is excess sweating, where even if it was a rainy day, a rain, uh, excuse me, a cold snowy day outside, and you're still someone who's gonna drench through your outfit, you have hyperhidrosis. You typically will need two treatments to get rid of nearly all the sweat and odor producing glands permanently. I have a lot of patients in our practice that are lifestyle type patients who say, doc, I don't really have any type of hyperhidrosis, I'm fine. But I notice that I do sweat a lot. If I could ever go the rest of my life without antiperspirants or harsh chemicals, could I get treated and is it safe? And the answer is absolutely. You only have about one to 2% of your body's sweat glands in your underarms. So one of the common questions that's a follow-up is, Dr. S, if I got this treatment, is it harmful? Aren't we supposed to sweat? 
And the answer is absolutely. You want to sweat, but you don't have to sweat from your underarms for your body to undergo the natural, safe cooling mechanism, which is exactly what sweating is, uh, unless you're anxious or concerned or things like that. Some people have that response. So in a nutshell, one treatment for typically for lifestyle patients, at least two treatments for hyperhidrosis patients, but you get a permanent outcome, which is pretty transformative. Thank you, Dr. Sridharani. Mm -hmm. What's the recovery like for a fat transfer? This is also from a viewer. Yeah, absolutely. So fat transfer, very popular surgical procedure. We perform it all the time in our practice. It's something that you have to keep people really safe. Um, what the viewer didn't specify was what area we were transferring the fat. In my practice, I basically transfer fat to three specific places. One are the buttocks, right? So our sort of Brazilian butt lift or fat grafting to the butt and the outer hips. Two, I do breast augmentation with fat transfer. So if I have a patient who comes in that does not want a breast implant or breast implants and wants an augmentation and wants to contour their body, I can remove the fat from one area of her body and then transfer it to the breast, like I said, for the buttocks. And then we can do nano or micro fat grafting to the face, which I'll often do when I'm doing a facelift or a neck lift because most people lose a lot of volume in the face as they mature. So I'll often put some fat back into the face like a biologic filler or their own filler because they're already there, they're already asleep and we can go and volumize the face and pull the face tighter. So if we're talking about recovery to fat transfer of the buttocks, any area that we inject fat, fat's very, very fragile. So when I inject it in the face or the breast or the body or the bum, we have to make sure that we're not putting a lot of pressure or compression on that area for usually the first three to six weeks, because that's when the lion's share of the healing and the blood flow is coming back. So imagine if you're doing fat transfer, I'm sucking the fat out maybe from the love handles or contouring the arms or the side of the chest or something. I'm taking that fat out. It has no blood supply. And now I need to safely re-inject it in and the blood body now identifies, well, this fat's okay. It's damaged, but it's okay. It's my fat. So it's their own fat. So I'm going to now let the blood flow grow back into it. So during that period, it's very important that there's no trauma to the area. You don't want to be sitting on it. So um, I tell patients that they're going to spend the first few weeks not sleeping on their stomach if it's on their breast or not sleeping on their back if it's in their butt or not, you know, pushing, laying face down if it's in their face for at least the first three to six weeks. Thank you. Very complete overview. Sure. What's the process like if someone wants to come see you and have their procedure there with you? This is also from a viewer. Sure. So we have patients, if, they're, if you're local, uh, meaning in New York or the tri-state area, um, consultations are very straightforward. Our team is amazing. We have a really big team because we're big on the confluence of luxury and aesthetic surgery. And that luxury part is the experience. So we have an amazing team that can help coordinate and work around your schedules. We, um, especially right now in the world, because of the way things have changed with travel and COVID, and something that we were offering before that even happened for our out of town and international patients is that we can set up remote visits much like this. We set them up through our electronic medical record system. So that way it's all HIPAA compliant and private. And we have the ability to at least start the conversation with our patients and often can even create the full plan, get everything set up, get the surgical date picked out, everything. And then usually our patients will come into New York a couple of, hour, a couple of days before just to verify and confirm the plan. But we are big on many touch points and curating a really special experience for our patients. So again, if you're local and you can come to New York, we can streamline things for you. Otherwise we can use technology and make it happen for you remotely. Thank you. What's the difference between a tummy tuck and a mini tummy tuck? Also from a viewer. Great question. Tummy tuck and mini tummy tuck often get used interchangeably, but they are, they are different procedures. A tummy tuck is effectively making a low hip to hip incision. Um, I hide it in the underwear, or the bikini line. One of my favorite things I tell patients is that, listen, the morning of surgery, bring me a pair of underwear or a bikini that you'd want to be able to wear. 
Just don't bring me dental floss you're going to wear in Miami or in the south of France because I can't hide it in that. But if you bring me something I can work with, I'm going to hide that uh, scar for you. But a mini tuck, I mean, a full tummy tuck is a hip to hip incision. I lift the skin off of the muscles. We do not enter the abdomen. We're not looking at intestines or or organs or anything like that. We are staying very superficial in a very safe plane above that layer. And I'm basically going to lift the skin. I'm going to tighten the six pack of muscles, meaning the rectus abdominis, which is going to help give our core strength back and help in general with posture and putting things back where they belong from multiple pregnancies or being really heavy, which stretch out the muscles. And I'm going to keep the belly button where it belongs, but I create a new cut for it. So I lift up the skin, take all the extra tummy skin out, tighten things, fix the muscle, and repair the belly button. But it's your belly button. That's a full tummy tuck. A mini tummy tuck is a shorter incision, still very low. However, we don't touch the belly button and we can't really work on tightening the muscles. So it's really for people who just have a lot of skin below the belly button or loose skin, what we call infra umbilical or below the belly button. So it's not as long, but you can't get out as much skin and you don't address the muscles if they've been stretched and you don't touch the belly button. So these are important differences, but it's a shorter incision. Thank you, Dr. Shudarani. Yeah, of course. Okay, so we have a viewer that wants to know which treatment would she see faster results, cool sculpting or Kybella? Um, great question. It totally depends on, it, part of it depends on the area. Faster treatments, they both actually will start to show around the same time. The body itself heals when the body wants to heal. So what that means is if we use cool sculpting, apply those pad paddles, or apply those applicators, freeze and crystallize the fat. The body's going to clear that area. It'll clear the dead fat, but things get worse before they get better. You get swelling, you have inflammation, some bruising, all normal, all part of the healing process, but it's not where you wake up, like if you got some filler in your lips, it's not like you wake up in the next, or you walk out of the office with more volumized lips. So it's gonna take a few weeks to even months to start seeing the outcome. Kybella, no different. When you inject, things get much worse before they get better. You're going to swell, you're going to bruise, you're going to be tender, all those things, normal, but you're destroying the fat and the body will start to clear it. So I don't really find, I haven't done, I'm big on science. I haven't done a side-by-side -side comparison of cool sculpting someone's arm and kybelling someone's arm and then seeing which one did, was faster. But in my experience of having done thousands of treatments, um, we can, we know, or at least I see that there's not a huge rapid um, recovery with one or the other. Thank you, Dr. Sotorani. For someone in their 20s, what is something that she can start doing to reduce the signs of aging in the face? For someone in their 20s, first of all, I think it's great that our 20 year old patients are thinking about anti aging. And I think probably the biggest element to that is going to be really, really good skincare. I think that we know can have a great preventative outcome. And listen, I'm in New York. My office is just a few blocks away from Bergdorf. Don't get me wrong. I love being able to go there or send the staff there or different things. But the, the makeup counter and the cosmetic counter there is probably not the right move. Save your money and invest in a really good professional skincare line that's going to help or program that's going to graduate you up higher to slightly more intense treatments that will have some element of a retinoid, which helps continually get that skin to turn over. But again, using other products that have growth factors in them. Um, there's again, from the three lines that I had mentioned earlier of Elastin, of Skin Medica and Environ, they have different products that we curate, but skincare as a global whole, and we do a full one, one and a half hour skincare consultation when patients come in talking about anti-aging in our practice, but skincare as a whole is probably the number one most important thing. Along with that, avoid the sun, okay? We love getting some sun. Obviously, April, you're, you're doing a great job of it because you're in Southern California. I know that you are a Southern, I mean, a Southern South Florida. 
and I think you were at USC, right? So you're Southern California. No, I, I appreciate I appreciate the California reference, but South Texas is oh, South Texas. originally South in the Texas. Dustin, Florida. Forgive me, forgive me. But nonetheless, uh, with that in Funny mind, locales. getting a lot of sun in those areas, and you do a great job. Our our patients that are young avoid avoiding and taking only healthy doses of the sun is so important. Um, we know that cigarettes and tobacco also have a really negative impact on wound healing and on the face. So there are social things that we realize that we can do every single day that aren't quick fixes, but have a cumulative impact and pay dividends as one matures. Um, there's no data out there that says necessarily that Botox is a preventative tool, but we do think theoretically that often if you're getting some Botox early on to keep some lines, creases and wrinkles at bay, that you're preventing some of those muscles from ever getting really so big that they'll create really deep etched lines. Um, but there's no way to guarantee that that's preventative, but a lot of patients do invest in their 20s in the occasional Botox and filler treatment just to keep things plump and to keep lines, creases, and wrinkles at bay. But I think lifestyle modification and skincare is so important. Thank you. What about dark circles? What could someone do? is a preventative measure. I'm glad you tied in what can someone do because I didn't know if I was going to be able to see mine through our uh, Zoom <laughs> call right now. Dark circles are the bane of so many people's existences and again can be caused by a lot of different things. Um, fillers and the tear trough are a very popular thing that we do but that's only if they have a very deep tear trough to fill so we can actually deflect the way the light and the shadow is going to hit the orbit or around the eye. Some patients have dark circles because they just have hyperpigmentation of the skin. So using something like a 4% hydroquinone or then even a Lytera 2.0, which is another product from the Skin Medical line, for example, can help modulate the skin and suppress the melanocytes or the prominent uh, skin cells that create pigment. Oh, we're frozen for a second. Okay. Dr. Shridharani, can you hear me now? I sure can. Perfect. Tell me where I left off because I was, I was on a roll. Do you remember where I froze? What was I talking about? Start back up. Perfect. So I think we were talking about dark circles yep. and I made the uh, tongue in cheek comment of, I hope I'm glad you specified that we weren't talking about necessarily my dark circles, which I might be able to even see if I didn't get enough rest, but dark circle treatment is secondary to so many different elements. Um, we, we get dark circles for a few different reasons. One can be pure and simple hyperpigmentation or darkening of that actual skin. Now we can modulate that skin by using things like hydroquinone or Lytera 2.0, different types of skincare products that can help either take pigment out or sometimes suppress melanocytes, which are the pigment producing cells, melanin, melanocytes produce melanin to help decrease the overall appearance of dark circles. You could have a lot of prominent veins and those veins look kind of bluish or purplish on the skin. So all of a sudden people come and say I have dark circles and you realize that it's actually not so much that there's anything wrong with the skin. They just have really thin skin with a lot of veins around the orbit or around the eye. So here you could try to do things to improve the texture and quality of the skin. Laser resurfacing can thicken that skin, try to create a little bit of a buffer. Um, chemical peels, good skin care, all those things to create constant skin turnover can hopefully improve that area. And other individuals, plain and simple, just have really deep tear troughs, which we can put filler in. I love doing tear trough filler use a cannula or a needle and safely place filler through those tear troughs to help deflect the way the light is hitting the orbit and casting a big shadow or crease. So treating dark circles is a function of diagnosis. Figure out what's the problem and then we can create a good treatment plan. So it's not a one size fits all kind of treatment. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I it's quite the overview. Of course. I try to, I love to teach. Um, you've, we've been together on some panels, April. We've gotten to know each other. We've been a partner with Hope now for several years and have really enjoyed that partnership and, and a forum 
to be able to teach people. So I try to give you a short answer, but I also try to uh, give a comprehensive one so our viewers know what we're doing. Yeah, you're the best. Thank you so much for everything that you're sharing with us today. That's a lot of information that I was not aware of. So thank you. Yeah, great. We have a viewer that's thinking of getting a mint lift. Can you tell us more about what she should expect and what the downtime is for that procedure? Sure. So there are different sort of proprietary suture lifts that are out there. So I won't comment specifically on mint lift, but what I can talk about are suture lifts because I think that's a bit more encompassing rather than, you know, a specific type of proprietary um, uh, lift. Mint lifts and suture lifts are kind of back in vogue because we actually have good materials to now do a suture lift. We used to have the thread lifts that people have heard of or the lunchtime lift where basically we took sutures, put them below the skin and helped pull and tighten the skin to temporarily give us at least some semblance of skin redraping or tightening. So there are different materials now, like PDO sutures. Um, these are, this is more of a technical thing for our, uh, this is more of a technical consideration for our um, clinicians who might be watching, but for our, for our other guests that are viewers or someone who may wanna have this treatment, there's PDO sutures, there's poly -L lactic acid and polyglycolic acid sutures. You may have heard of things like um, the uh, like Sinclair's InstaLift or things like that. Basically, we're taking a suture that either has a cone or a barb microscopically in it. We put it under the skin in one direction, through the skin the other direction, lift and tighten, and then it's going to suspend that skin and hold it in place while the body tries to heal and keep it up there. And usually that process takes a few weeks to months for the skin to kind of set where it's going to. And, uh, but most people experience probably anywhere from four to seven days of social downtime. You can have some bruising, you can, you'll have swelling. You may notice a little bit of dimpling where those injection sites were. That's all normal. So this is not a do it on Monday and go out on Tuesday type of thing. I tell patients to block their social calendar for four to five days. So it's a great Wednesday, Thursday type of treatment. And by Monday, Tuesday at work, they're looking really great, refreshed and lifted. But you can have some prolonged bruising and only you know how long you bruise. Uh, but that's how I guide my patients. And that's down to the individual. I mean, everyone kind of knows what their bruising threshold is. Exactly. What about facial fillers? What could someone do to ensure that they last as long as possible on their own? This is also from a viewer. Great. The, that viewer is also tapping in a key to my heart. We are big, big on injectables and taking a surgical approach to those injectables. Um, fillers are great. They're a broad class of volumizing agents and some of them work by being a hyaluronic acid gel to just kind of plump things up, which, which can last up to two years depending on the treatment. Others like such, such as Sculptra, for example, are what we call biostimulatory. So you inject them and they create, they force the body to create its own collagen. And that's what will create volumization and longevity for a few years. Um, there's Radius, which is calcium based, also can have a long lasting impact. It's a bigger discussion. Point is fillers for longevity typically are, you want to, if it depends on the product, so product selection plays a big role in longevity, technique, product placement, and also there's an element of metabolism or if you, for example, are putting it in the nasal labial folds or around the mouth, if you have an area that gets a lot of action and a lot of motion, a lot of movement, your body may kind of break it down a little bit more because of the muscles and the way that it's moving things around. Whereas other areas, if I do a liquid rhinoplasty for someone for fillers in the nose, I've had patients that have had two years of longevity and still are very happy and notice very little difference or change. The tear trough, patients can get a long period of time because there's not a lot of motion here, but in the mid face, the mouth, the nasal labial folds, sometimes these are areas where we get, you know, 10 months to a year and a half out of, depending on the product we use. Thank you. We have a viewer question. She wants to know, what are the options when it comes to treating gynecomastia? 
gynecomastia. So gynecomastia, for those of our viewers who may not know what that is, is development of breast tissue in men. That is what true gynecomastia is. It's glandular breast tissue in men. Typically, this happens during adolescence and puberty when there's a lot of hormonal changes in uh, young men. And so it's basically, you can have a really thin gentleman, uh, a 17-year-old or 18-year-old who has very little fat on his body, takes his shirt off in gym class and notices basically a pocket of fat or almost breast-like development, usually right by the areola, which is the colored portion outside of the nipple. Obviously, that's a very socially distressing type of problem. Right, um, for someone's child, that would, you know, someone would certainly want to be able to help them. Absolutely. Yeah. So that is, and you're right, and, and so the, we know the social construct of that. Unfortunately, the first step usually is weight, because most of the time, once the hormones start to change, and balance out, they'll get a significant resolution and decrease in that breast glandular tissue. But if not, there are other things you have to do. You have to make sure that they don't have any type of tumor. They could have a testicular mass. They could have a hormonal issues. There's a lot of different elements as to why, so you get to the root cause. But if surgery is indicated, which is going to typically be the best thing, you make a small cut around the areola, lift up the areola. We don't take it off. We don't take the nipple off. You lift it up, take out all that glandular tissue, sometimes do a little bit of very finesse liposuction through the other parts of the chest to blend it, and then stitch everything back into place. That's gynecomastia. Often though, people get gynecomastia and pseudogynecomastia confused, and there's a difference. Pseudogynecomastia is something that we see where it's just basically having a lot more fat accumulating in the male chest. So this is something that we see in individuals that are heavy, overweight, the aging process for men. Um, it's associated with excess marijuana usage, where basically you start to actually get breast-like chest development, except it's not gland, it's actually fat. And so here we can take a strategy of aggressive liposuction. You may need to take out some of the skin and reduce the skin if the gentleman has really started to actually form breast-like um, a shape because it's stretched out the skin. So even if you suction them, the skin doesn't flatten back down. And um, one of the things that we've done, we had a really uh, wonderful before and after and a reveal um, on, on the doctor's show on CBS a few years ago or last year, but we've also treated pseudogynecomastia with Kybella. So we've done the injections and done basically surgery in a syringe for the chest to improve the contour, uh, much like one would consider doing with liposuction and then like J-plasma to help suction down or, or help, help tighten up the skin. So there's gynecomastia and pseudogynecomastia, different treatments, different patient demographics, and you have to know which one you're trying to treat. Thank you, Dr. Shredrani. Mm -hmm. Moving back over to skincare, and you've touched on this quite a bit, but what are some key ingredients that users should be looking for with products, you know, vitamin C, retinols? Well, Ian, you're already such a great skincare expert, April, so you just already started to mention some of the key yeah. elements. No, yeah, I mean, I'm serious. You, you take good care of your skin, and we talk about some of these things at our, um, you know, different events that we do together with, with Hope. So, yeah, so, you know, vitamin A is a, is a key factor. It's a cornerstone, retinol, retinoids. That's what really helps turn over a lot of the skin. So Retin-A has been a known uh, boom, in, boon, so to speak, for the skincare world because that's what helps turn over a lot of skin cells and cellular turnover to improve a freshness type of look. I think some products that have hyaluronic acid can be really great. Um, I do love even HA5, which is a product made by the skin med on the Skin Medical line. It's basically five different blends of hyaluronic acids. It just really makes the skin feel and look just kind of have that dewiness to it in a nice way without it looking oily or greasy. So I think having that element is important. Vitamin C and ascorbic acid is also very important. And then there are a whole host of growth factors um, that, that, you know, if I was throwing out names that may end up just sounding like a bunch of, you know, like a chemistry set. But no, keep going. It's very helpful. Yeah. So all these different growth factors, 
also can have a huge um, improvement and element. But some of the other products that are out there also trigger or signal growth factors in the skin. So think of it almost like a radio signal, right? Like you're trying to put out a signal from one part with a topical to stimulate a portion of the deeper part of the dermis or the skin to help regenerate with transforming growth factor beta, TNF alpha, platelet derived growth factor. There's all sorts of different elements that come from the hair follicle as well that are regenerative in nature. And so these are different elements that are going to be present in different concentrations. And then some of these elements are proprietary towards the company. So we don't even know exactly what that product is, but we know that a blend of it triggered a lot of growth from the cellular level and the tissue. But um, those are some of my, those are some of the more important elements. Thank you, Dr. Shodarani. Mm -hmm. What's the most common procedure that you perform there at your office? That's, uh, gosh, that's tough. So I think probably on the non-surgical side, it's going to be as a broad scope, our injectables. Um, so I do a lot of obviously surgery and a surgery, so a ton of Kybella. We've done about 4,000 treatments in the past few years alone, but probably even more than Kybella, I do more fillers slash Botox, right? Toxins. So our toxins like Botox, um, Xeomin, Dysport, and Juvo are the four FDA approved toxins and we inject all of them in our practice. So toxin injections and then our fillers, things like our Voluma or our Restylane Define or our Versa or Sculptra. So those are probably bread and butter on a daily basis, things that I do every single day. Surgically, I would say probably the mo thing we do the most are a kind of spectrum are mommy makeovers. I mean, there's a lot of interest for us to do breast augmentation and breast lift along with liposuction and abdominal contouring. So that kind of ties in as a whole spectrum, but we have a very robust facial aesthetic injectable practice, but then also a very busy surgical component because we have our own operating room here at the facility. With everyone at home right now, quarantining, looking in mirrors. What do you foresee being the big rush of procedures when you guys are, you know, back up and rolling 100%? Sure thing. Well, looking in Zooms, forget even mirrors, right? We see ourselves. I'm like, oh, maybe I need to address that. Um, so it's, it's like one of my, uh, who will not, she will remain unnamed, one of my A-list celebrity patients came into the office in New York before, as she had heard that some of these things were happening in Asia, as she said, when this whole thing ends, Someone may know what my real hair color is, but they're not going to know what my real face dropped down to without my Botox and fillers. So I suspect that when this is over and it's appropriate and safe for people to be able to come back into the office, um, we're going to see a mad rush of injectables and our um, lasers are probably, it's going to be a little tough because we're starting to get past laser season, but we have a lot of patients who are already wanting to know when they can get their hydrofacials, microneedling with PRP, and most importantly, when can they get their fillers and their toxin? And I think those are gonna be the quick fixes to really boost things and make them look great and feel great again. And go through that. Why is there a season for lasers? Which I know, but a lot, a lot of people aren't aware. Yeah, of course, great question. So I think the seasonality for that plain and simple is your skin is going to be a little bit sensitive. Um, and, and depending on how aggressive of a laser that I've done, um, there's going to be a lot of sensitivity to the skin when a patient has undergone a laser treatment and that sensitivity includes the sun. So you want to make sure that you don't get a lot of sun exposure because you have a high risk of burning, of scarring, and of hyperpigmentation or, or major devastating changes to the face if you get a lot of excess skin on skin that's already been lasered. So that's why there's a seasonality. Um, our patients typically want to get lasered in the mid to late fall and throughout the winter. Um, once spring and summer roll around, uh, we really, really have to take a hard look if we're going to do an aggressive laser. And there are ways to do very fine, kind of less aggressive lasers just to kind of give a little bit of a glow. Those can be continue to be done, but you still have to be careful that you're not getting that intense south, you know, Southern California, South Texas, or south, you know, Southern Florida type of sun during that period because you could really create a problem with the skin. Thank you, Dr. Shridharani. We have a question from Devanshi Meshrani from Hope Living. She says, hello. Yes, hi, how are you, Devanshi? Hope Living I fam. I know I can't hear her, but hope you're well. Thanks for asking. Well, this question is from her. She wants to know, are skin lasers safe for 
for darker toned skins? She has Indian skin. Is it safe for her? Yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a really great question. And, you know, she's of Indian descent, your founder, Kamal, along with Seth. I mean, Seth, of course, is an Indian, but Kamal is, and yeah. myself included in that. Uh, there are some safe lasers that can be performed on what we call higher FSTs, Fitzpatrick skin types. So kind of going through the spectrum, Fitzpatrick 6 is someone who's of African descent. Fitzpatrick 1 is someone who is of very Northern European, Nordic countries, very, very fair, burns easily, that type of spectrum. So when you've got people that are probably like Devanchi, who's, who's in that middle range, has, a, has probably like a 4, uh, Fitzpatrick 4, I'm probably a 4, 3 slash 4. There are lasers that we can do that can be safe that can be done appropriately, but it really requires an expert eye and expert settings because very quickly you can create a burn or cause a problem. There are some types of lasers that we would not at all do on certain higher Fitzpatrick skin types, but I've done a profractionated laser, meaning sort of like a Fraxel, or in our practice we use a Cyton Jewel laser, which is a beautiful laser. It's targets a little bit different in the skin, so it doesn't create the same type of thermal damage as some other lasers do. And you can adjust the settings to really make a nice treatment outcome, but we're a bit more conservative uh, when it comes to treating individuals that have some color in their skin. Do you have an age limit for lasers? On, on the upper end or lower end? On the lower end. On the lower end? How young of a patient would you see for a procedure such as that? Well, so part of the thing is, is that, you know, we can, we do lasers and microneedling or different elements on individuals that are suffering from acne scars. I've got patients that are in their teens that unfortunately have terrible, terrible acne scarring and we'll do a fractionated or a profractionated laser to basically microscopically poke tiny holes into a bad acne scar to help collagen rebuild. We can do it with microneedling and different elements, but lasers. So I'll do lasers on my, you know, 16, 17, 18 year old patients with their parents' permission, of course, if they're, not, if they're not of 18 or older, to be able to help improve it. But for typical, just sort of laser um, maintenance or for skin improvement, most of my patients, I'd say, are in their mid to late, late 20s and onwards is the lower limit, because you don't really see a lot of fine lines, creases, or problems like that in my patients that are in their early to mid 20s. But if someone spent a lot of time in the sun, if they have some genetic predispositions, already to some fine lines increases. I may treat patients who are in their late 20s already with um, a laser or an, or an intermittent chemical peel to help improve texture and quality of the skin. How would you compare radio frequency to traditional laser treatments? Well, I think RF, you know, you can have RF work in an ablative capacity, but RF is usually something that I see more often in conjunction with skin tightening. So I don't think a lot of lasers are necessarily that effective as a tightening measure. I think lasers are great for resurfacing or for a quality of skin improvement. But I have seen you know, the radio frequency with microneedling elements do seem to work well from a tightening lens. Um, but I prefer RF in conjunction with an attempt or desire post body contouring or liposuction to create more skin tightening, um, although you can use it in some capacity as well for skin quality improvement, but they're doing slightly different things and work through different elements. Uh, Radio frequency is usually trying to get the skin hot enough to hit a critical temperature so that you get a shrink wrapper tightening effect. And we can do that with lasers, ultrasound, radio frequency, plasma, helium plasma. So all of those things are different um, skin quality improvements but from a shrink wrap or tightening element. Thank you. Do you have a lot of patients that come in that want to do a combo of all three? Fillers, RF, lasers, is that possible? Yeah, so a lot of our patients, because we do have a, um, a really wonderful patient base, we've got our local New Yorkers and tri-state area patients here in Manhattan being at 70th and 5th, but we have a pretty sizable with New York, of course, being one of the markets that gets people come from all over the globe consistently. Um, we have a lot of patients that we got to maximize my time. I'm only going to be in New York for these few days or for this one day. What can we do? We can curate a plan specific for patients based on what we're hoping to do. So we can think about, okay, well, let's first inject them with their filler. 
then do a laser, but do a laser that doesn't go to a certain type of depth because we don't want it to impact negatively what we've already done with our laser. Let's inject our Botox here, our Kybella here. So we do combination therapies on the same part of the face all the time. It really just depends on what our patients are looking for. Sometimes we have to say no because I want to keep people safe. But a lot of times if we put our mind to it and really figure out and understand anatomy because that dictates everything, we know that a certain treatment is only going to hit this depth of the skin. The filler is going to be much deeper because I'm going to put it on the bone to lift up the cheekbone. The Botox is going into the muscle here to help relax the lines and creases from that. And my laser is going to stay very superficial, for example. So I'll put a plan together to keep my patients safe because I know the anatomy. Thank you. So going ahead and wrapping up, looking ahead, you know, what would you like to close out with in terms of final thoughts and maybe something that you've learned through this time period? Well, I think this has been a very strange, interesting, and of course, scary time in the world. Um, I think we're going to be learning a lot about ourselves and society from what we've encountered due to COVID-19. Um, I think this will be things that people are gonna write about in the history books like the Spanish influenza of this era or, or of this you know, generation. This has been something that's impacted every person in every part of the world. And so I think again, this, this time or this pause in the practice has given me the ability to have a lot of introspection in recognizing the priorities of how we're going to continue to come out of this, take care of our patients, have a greater appreciation for my staff, which we've managed to keep all of them together. Building a team is so hard. So I'm really excited about the fact that we have our whole team together still uh, and helping support different endeavors in the practice. So I'd say it's been a very introspective time. From the standpoint of our one hour together, I've learned that there's a lot of interest um, for people at home and I'm so grateful for the opportunity to reach them through a platform like Hope Beauty. Um, the partnership has been fantastic and it gives us a voice to be able to share with the world and to the people that are taking the time out of their lives and schedules to hopefully learn something. So I'd say that I'm just really privileged and honored that anyone wants to listen and that people are asking questions and it's an honor to be able to share on such a great global platform such as the Hope brand. Dr. Shodrani, thank you so much. Thank you for all these kind words and being the best partner, truly. The way you run your practice, your business, your team, really exceptional and we are so thrilled to have you as our partner. Well, thank you. It means the world to me. And uh, once again, thanks for giving us a voice and spending an hour of your you know, busy schedule and your time with me as well. So. Very appreciative. Thank you. Appreciative, Beth. Thank you so much. Wishing you and the team for everyone to stay healthy and safe. And thank you for all of our viewers that turned in today. Likewise. Take care. Hope to see you soon in Miami. Absolutely. See you soon.